All right, so I'm continuing my series on whole life insurance versus index universal life insurance. And in this video, we're gonna be talking about market predictability because let's face it, if you are buying a life insurance product, chances are one of the reasons that you're buying it is because you want that kind of guaranteed growth. You wanna make sure that you're not losing your money to market losses and you're trying to get away from the market unpredictability. And when I say market, I mean the stock market. So. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell. That way you're notified every time I launch a new video because I got videos like this coming out every single day. Let's get into it. Hey, what's going on, cash flow hackers? It's Chris with Life 180. This video, we're talking about whole life insurance versus index universal life insurance, market predictability or unpredictability, and how the growth uh, and, and market unpredictability functions in each side of inside of each of the whole life policy and uh, an IUL. And so. Let's, let's face it this way. A lot of people, pretty much everybody, let's face it, that sells index universal life is selling it based on the fact that there's upside potential compared to a whole life policy. And while I won't dispute that that may be uh, the fact on paper, I always kind of tell people life doesn't exist on a spreadsheet. Life happens. And what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to show you the variables that come into play on why I think market unpredictability and market uh, market conditions, the impact that they'll actually have on an IUL. And it's not a matter of what the IUL does while you're accumulated money, because let's face it, if you're buying the IUL, going back to last video, if you're buying this IUL, chances are you're buying it for what? You're buying it for tax-free income in retirement. You're buying it because of the sales pitch that it gives you upside potential, downside protection, and you can't lose money due to market losses. And that is the big selling point. Honestly, that's the big selling point that got me excited about it and got me selling it uh, when I first entered the life insurance space, right? Like that is what got me excited about this. And, you know, as time went on in my career and I started seeing the policies not performing and I had to do annual reviews with people and I realized that, man, the market was going up and it was outperforming what I thought it would. It was outperforming the illustrated rate, yet somehow, the policy wasn't performing the way that I illustrated that it would or should, right? And when I when I realized that, and I realized that the the, the policy was underperforming expectations, I started having issues. I, I I felt like to keep my integrity, I had to start selling whole life insurance. Actually, I, I, I took a step away altogether and started doing some research. And in that, I found that whole life insurance was in fact what I thought I was selling the whole time. And Let's, let's talk about some variables right now, right? So a couple things that come into play, and I'm gonna to go to the board here because uh, I think it's important to understand this stuff. So let's, let's talk about market predictability. So the idea that you're going for is continuous growth, right? So the idea of an IUL, the idea is, okay, if the market's going up and down, up and down, up and down, the idea is that an IUL would do this. And I'm not saying this is how it works, but I'm saying this is how it's sold. It would say, oh, oh, this thing gets a little wonky on me here. So the idea is like that it would go there and instead of flattening, actually here, instead of flattening, it would go there. And then as it started going up again, it would go higher and then it would go up again. And you would have more gains because when it was going down in this section, you would go flat. When it was going down in this section, you'd go flat and then it'd go up. Therefore, you have higher highs because you're avoiding these losses. Now, here's the deal. On paper, that's fine. You can't lose money due to market losses due to this because you're never invested in the index. I think this is really important to understand. You're never invested in the index. So a lot of people will tell you you're gonna be in the S&P 500 index. And the bottom line is, if you have $10,000 in a, in a cash value policy, your money is not really going $10,000 right to the S&P 500 right? You are actually going, that's not how it works. What's happening is the $10,000 goes into the general fund of the life insurance company, right? That general fund is going to create a return. And the return is going to be right now, it's about four and a half percent. Okay. So what happens is this four and a half percent creates an options budget. So what would happen here, that four and a half percent leads to about a $450 options budget. I'll do op bud. Uh, options budget. And so what happens with this options budget is they then 
go and they buy call options of the S&P 500 or whatever index. It doesn't matter what index it is, but whatever index they're speaking about, this is the flow of money, how it works. So a lot of people think that you're just participating, but you're not really ever participating in the S&P 500. You're participating in it, but you're not really ever invested in it. And the things to understand here is that the performance of the S&P 500 and the way that policies and the reason that policies haven't performed really well is because it has nothing to do with the performance of the S&P 500 itself. You know what it has everything to do with? It has everything to do with what the general fund is doing, what the options budget is, because that's what's gonna create the general fund, and then it has to do with the cost of options, which goes up and down. Okay, now I'm telling you this, and this is, this is a bit of an involved video, but this is so important to understand. So when I'm talking about market predictability, right? So when we're talking about growth and the desired goal and not being able to lose money to market losses, well, let's talk about what happens and, and the impact that this has on your IUL policy. Because what happens is, um, is people say, well, right now, interest rates are gonna go up. So they say, well, the general fund is gonna go up. So that's gonna go, uh, that's gonna improve the four and a half percent, the general fund, let's just say they get to five and a half percent. I don't think they'll get quite that high anytime real soon, but let's just say they did just for the sake of this video. They get to five and a half percent. So that would say, well, the options budget goes from 450 up to 550, right? Because it's that 1% gets an extra hundred bucks. That increases our options budget. If, I mean, that may not seem like a lot, but that's really like a 20% increase, right? Almost. It's like 20, actually it's just over a 20% increase, like 20, 22% increase, something like that. So this is a 20, we'll just call it for the sake of round numbers, 22% increase compared to the options budget before. So that would seem really uh, effective. But the problem is it doesn't work that well. You would think that IULs would perform really well in that environment. And by the way, if this were a whole life policy, this five and a half percent because it's the general fund is gonna have a direct correlation to the dividend payouts and it would increase on a guaranteed basis the dividends that would be paid in a whole life policy. However, in an IUL, what's gonna happen is that, that increased options budget, I'm gonna scroll up here, let's just call it 550 now instead of, five, instead of 450, now goes and buys call options. However, what happens in an increasing interest rate environment? Let's look at history. In increasing interest rate environment, it creates more volatility. What happens historically with more volatility? Options, costs, go up. All right, so yes, we have a higher options budget, but if the call options costs increase, well then that negates this win, right? So as options costs go up, that can have a negative impact on, on everything, right? So what also happens in an increasing interest rate environment? Asset prices go down, okay? So even, even if the options budget didn't work, right? Or it didn't go up, you need all these three things to work for you, right? You need, you need volatility to remain in an increasing interest rate environment, I wanna add. You need volatility to remain level. You need options cost to stay level. And you need volatility to not be crazy, I should say, which is unlikely. You need options cost to stay level and not go up, which is unlikely again. And you need asset prices to not go down, which if you understand the stock market, right? And I'll, I'll go here, I don't care if it's asset prices, real estate, if it's stocks, whatever. The bottom line is we are a debt-based society and as interest rates go up, that creates stress on debt. And that debt will take more cash out of the economy and that cash coming out of the economy generally presses asset prices down. I should use red because red is bad, right? And so. Uh, we're gonna go from there. And so what happens is in, in this environment, even if the cap rates and the, the, the indexes you know, don't do horrible, if the rates, well, actually, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna draw that out. Let's, let's say the cap rate is uh, 9% right now. Even if they don't go down, right? Even if they were to, even, let's just say they increased them. Let's say they increased them to 10%. If it, let's say the environment perfectly worked out here. 
and they could in increase cap rates to 10%. Well, guess what? It doesn't matter really, because if in an increasing rate environment that, that looks like it's gonna be good and the cap rate goes up, but that makes all the asset prices go down, you know, you're still staying here. Your index can't lose money to market losses, right? You can't lose money because of that. But the bottom line is what else do you have here? You're not gonna lose the money there, but you have the cost of insurance, you have admin fees, etc. And that may not seem like a horrible thing, but here's the deal. What I want to do is I want to go back to this. And if you, if you see this, you'll recognize it from the last video I did. And we we're talking about the cost of insurance. Now, if in fact you get to retirement and I'm just going to clear these out so I can focus a little bit on this. If you, if you get to this point and we, and we figure this out and you go here and it's like, all right, you're 68 years old and you have, uh, you're wanting to start taking income out of this, right? And for retirement, cash-free income. So now you have, uh, you wanna take uh, your income out of the policy and out of that policy, you can't lose money to market losses, but you still have the cost of insurance and you have total policy charges of $6,565. Guess what? Those are your losses because if you didn't have the gains in the policy to make up for it, you lost 6,500 bucks. Now, what is that worth to you? I don't know. We're going to go to another page and we're going to look at the policy uh, amounts and the sizes because there's variables on this illustration that include income and there's other loan expenses and there's other things because if you're taking loans against the policy, actually, let me see if I can find it. All right, so what we have here is I have this, this, this is the policy loan ledger. So you can see at the same age 68, oh, at, at age 68, uh, end of policy year 51, this is showing an index loan and this is showing he started index loans earlier than this, but there's a loan charge of $105,000. There's, they're, they're saying you're assuming loan credits. By the way, this is never gonna happen, or I mean, it can happen, but it's not gonna happen on a consistent basis. This, this difference here, loan credits to loan, uh, loan charges, this is the arbitrage that allows these policies to illustrate so astronomically insane uh, because they're basing 50 basis points of positive arbitrage, right? Regulation AG49A is getting updated to eliminate the ability to, to illustrate this positive arbitrage because it's not what happens in actuality. So the heyday of this policy getting illustrated like this is coming to an end, right? Which is a beautiful thing. Now, here's the deal. What happens here is because this person started taking income in their 50s at $77,000 a year, but not only do you have that $77,000 that year that you're taking a loan against, you have the loan charges, meaning it's basically the interest rate you're paying on the loan, on top of it, and you can see here, the outstanding loan balance is $2,244,000, right? That is where the loan charge is coming from because you have this big loan balance that you're paying a, a, a loan rate on, let's call it, I think it's uh, just over uh, 5%, right? Or maybe just 4.5% or something like that in this policy. At the end of the day, you can see that you have $536,000 of cash value here, okay? Think about this. And now what you have is $105,000 of loan charges. And on a negative year, this, this number here that they're assuming is a credit, if you're using this in retirement in a negative year, you don't get that credit. It shows on an illustration that you get it every year, but in reality, you don't get it every year, right? That's, that's crazy. So what you have happen here is you have this $105,000 of loan charges. And let me go back here. Let's go to the other page. So when I go back here and we look at this and we also have the 6,565, so we got like 101,000 uh, and change and then 6,500, I think it was 101 and change. So let's just say it was like $107,000. So when they say due to market conditions, when you take all the other things that I started this video with and you look at the how uh, the policy actually does its charges, how it gets its index rate, how it, it is what it is. What, what, what's happening here is in a down year in this year, this specific policy in this year, you can't lose to market losses, quote unquote, but you would lose $107,000 in this policy. So out of all that money, you'd lose $107,000. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to this other sheet because I think it's really important to see, right? And I'm going to go back here to the policy loan ledger, and you can see you lose $107,000, 
Look at this, you only had $536,000, $536,154. So what I'm gonna do really quickly, and I gotta do this just for, for interesting, you can't lose money to policy to market losses. That's what they say, right? Now I'm gonna do a math here because you got $536,000 in your, in your account there. 107 divided by 536. That was basically a 20% loss, okay? So yeah, they say you can't lose money to market losses, but this policy, as I showed it here, when you take certain assumptions into consideration, basically has the equivalent of 20% of losses. And now you can't compare this to real market losses because this actually gets way worse because now the next year, that 20% gets compounded because your net amount at risk for insurance gets worse. And at the end of the day, here's the bottom line. When you're working, when you're in your working years, this is not gonna be a big deal. If this happens when you're funding the policy and you're young and you're not taking income and the market has down years, no big deal. But when it happens, when you're in retirement and you're utilizing this at 60, 70 years old, these ages, and that's when this happens to you and you have bad years and they say you can't lose money due to market losses, well, look what's happening here. I'm showing you here, if this happens one or two years in a row, this policy will completely implode. They say that it's not possible. I'm gonna tell you right now, if you do not get this, if you do not protect yourself from this, market volatility is a real big thing. Market unpredictability is a real big thing. You are not protected against market unpredictability with an IUL. Now, what I wanna show you is that with a whole life policy, you may not have the upside, quote unquote, but it's gonna be a savings alternative. You can see why I say IULs are investment alternatives because you can lose money and you will lose money. I will bet my life that this policy will have nothing but problems, nothing but problems. Whereas a whole life policy, the one thing I know is that it's gonna start and it's gonna build and it's gonna build and it's gonna build and that's the way it goes. And if you fund it properly, if you design it properly and you utilize it properly, you can borrow against it, you can control the borrowing costs at a better rate. You're never gonna to wanna to utilize life insurance as your main source of borrowing or main source of income in retirement. But once again, it's a great volatility, I gotta spell buffer. That's what it is. That's what you're using it for. So hopefully that makes sense. If you have any questions, go ahead and comment in the comment section below. As always, I love to engage with people that have comments or questions about Index Universal Life versus Whole Life Insurance. I'm a nerd. It's one of my favorite things in the world to talk about. Just ask my wife. It drives her crazy. Uh, but that's it. So anyway, hope you found value in this. Feel free to reach out if you need anything. Get back to the agent that shared this video with you. Happy to help you in any way that we possibly can. If you have an IUL, and you're looking at it and you're fearful of it and you don't know what to do, this is a huge thing that you need to get ahead of. You're probably not gonna see the problems until it's too late. That's my big issue with Index Universal Life. So, till next time, have a blessed, inspirational day. Hopefully this helped. If it did, share it, like it, get it out there to the world. Appreciate you and your time and watching it if you're here at this point in time. Have a great one, see ya.